and welcome to HTBB Online. I'm Andrea, and this is Leon, and we're your hosts for today. We hope you've all been keeping well under MCO. Uh, in fact, why don't you let us know, you know, what have you been doing to keep busy uh, while at home? Let us know in the chat below. Hey, we have a great service today. Um, Abby is preaching, and as always, we will have a time to pray. So no matter what you're going through this MCO, please know that uh, we are with you, yeah. and we would love to pray for you. Yeah, so if you'd like prayer for anything at any time during the service, we have a whole team of online pastors just waiting to pray with you. Um, so all you need to do is just hit request prayer and we'd love to pray with you. No request is too big or too small. Let's begin now with a time of worship. We believe that God can meet with us wherever we are when we worship. Yeah, so why don't we stand? Um, and if you want, you can, you can put your hands out um, as I'm doing. Uh, and I'll pray before we worship. Let's spend a moment in silence to just still our hearts and be aware of God's presence. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can encounter you wherever we are. Lord, we pray that as we open up our hearts in worship, that you would speak to us. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship.
rising glory Your love is like the wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Oh, Lord There is a king Seated among us Let every heart receive him now Where there is praise He will inhabit There will be grace and mercy all around Every burden will be lifted in his presence every trophy will be laid down at his feet there is a name that reigns above all others jesus christ the king To the land, honor and glory. Worthy is he who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power. He is alive, and the stone is rolled. All our worship will belong to Him forever Death is conquered and our Savior holds the keys There is a name that reigns above all others Jesus Christ, the King above
Elohim. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for Israel and Palestine that there may be peace in the land. We ask, Lord, that as peace talks continue, that you will preserve the lives of the helpless and those caught in the crossfire. We also pray for peace in Myanmar, that your will be done in the land. We ask, Lord, that even though things look bleak, that your message of hope and love will prevail. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father Lord, we lift up Malaysia into your hands. We pray for all Malaysians affected by the MCO, especially those that are suffering physically, mentally, or financially. Lord, won't you pour out your spirit of healing and peace upon this land. We pray for our frontliners and our leaders, that they may govern and serve with compassion and wisdom that comes from you. Lord, we also want to pray for the ongoing vaccination drive, for steady supply of vaccines, for efficient allocation of appointments, and that those receiving the vaccines will remain safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we want to commit HDBB to your hands, Father God. Father, I want to especially pray, pray for the leaders and the pastors, Father. Father, may you guide them, protect them, and keep them in the palm of your hands, Father God. Father, speak to them on a daily basis, Father God, and may you bring forth your word through them, Father, a word in season for the church. Lord, I lift up our congregation to you. We are your church. And even though we are not physically together now, Lord, may you unite us in one spirit and one heart. Help us to always keep you in the center of our lives. Lord God, may you bless the HDB facilities and the production team with the spirit of excellence. Let all the videos and podcasts go forward smoothly to touch more lives. For the Lord, please protect all the children in his TV and we all know you love us us and you are always be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for leading us in prayer. You know, we've got some amazing stuff lined up uh, in the life of the church. Andrew, why don't you tell us? Yes, so Alpha Online is starting on Wednesday, the 9th of June. Uh, If you can already think of someone to invite, uh, leave a star emoji in our chat. Uh, Or if you want to invite them right away, go to htbb.org slash alpha. We have invites you can download and share them with your friends. Yeah, you know, we we took some time to, to catch up uh, with some people who've had amazing stories to share. Uh, so why don't we why don't we watch one of them right now? Can you tell us um, whether you were a churchgoer before you came on Alpha? Um, so before I joined Alpha, um, no, I I never went to a church. Um, I was born Hindu, but um, I have had some inclination uh, towards knowing Jesus better, to understand Christianity as a faith. I've had a lot of Christian friends who have who have kind of nudged me in the past, uh, but yes, I, of course, I'd never been to a church before. How did you end up coming on Alpha? Or how did you hear about it? So this actually um, uh, happens uh, spontaneously. It is my house owner. Uh, yeah, she once suggested me about this course and impromptu, I said very casually, yeah, I don't mind seeing what this is about. I had absolutely no idea what Alpha is, but when she, when she spoke about it, she initially sent me a WhatsApp message, I just browse through and um, without um, any expectation, I would say, I, I just said, yeah, why not spend? Yeah, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of other things in life. I don't mind spending uh, an hour and a half uh, every week. So that's how actually it started. What would you say was uh, a particular highlight um, during your time on Alpha? Initially, when I joined Alpha, I had absolutely no expectation out of it. I was just going with the flow. Somebody had suggested me and I attended. But as it progressed, I think one thing which stood out for me 
coming from a science background, everything that was said in Alpha was based on evidence and logic because human mind uh, believes in rational, believes in logic. And what I liked about Alpha is when Nick and Pippa and, and the two hosts of um, Alpha, when they spoke about each and every aspect, this was all evidence and logic and rational behind. I already, as I said before, I, I had some, some sort of inclination or belief in God but I think it kind of reinforced, re-strengthened my belief. Um, but above all, I think the weekend away classes when um, when I was asked to uh, do the prayers in my mind, I really felt um, I really felt some force being with me, um, as they call it, as the Holy Spirit. But I, uh, it was one moment for me. I just don't have words to describe it, which which is why I think everybody must really experience experience it. Um, it hardly takes it hardly takes a, an hour and a half per week, and then I think, uh, given the time that we spend doing a lot of um, activities, I see there's absolutely no reason why one cannot spend an hour per week, and just just go through it and feel it, and maybe you 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 will have your own own experience to feel it. That's very well said, uh, Sitana. What would you say is the biggest difference that Jesus has made in your life? I feel I am far more calm as a person. Um, I don't proclaim that I'm going to uh, yeah, spend 24-7 of my life worshipping. But in my mind, uh, even if it's those five minutes in a day that I pray Him, that gives me immense strength, specifically this time of pandemic. I think uh, Jesus is my source of strength. He is my guiding force. I let him in and I know I'm in a safe hand. I know he loves me. So I think it's it's just a belief. That's that's a huge source of strength, uh, which makes me feel very calm and composed and easy. It's so good to hear stories like these. So if you can think of anyone you'd love to invite, uh, just remember Alpha kicks off on the 9th of June. And you know, if you're not so much of a URL and downloads person, we'll also be sharing these invites on our social media platforms. So you just be able to screen grab, uh, tag a friend and invite them along to Alpha. Now we're gonna go into HTBB news, uh, but before we do, this is also a chance for us to give um, and you know, on that, we just love to say thank you so much in advance for all of your giving. Uh, it makes such a difference to the life of the church. So with that, let's give as we watch this week's edition of HDBB News. SPTC will be having an open house week on worship this June. We will feature two lectures on worship theology by Reverend Dr. Nick Drake. Nick is a pastor at Gastric Church and is involved in a songwriting ministry called Worship for Everyone. On June 3rd, we have an afternoon session on pastoral care with Kay Lawrence. Kay is a highly experienced counsellor and will speak about how church leaders can support church members struggling with mental health and how the church can be equipped to care better for one another. We are so excited to announce that June 7 is our early bird deadline. Early bird applicants will get exclusive SPTC merchandise and early access to sessions. Terms and conditions apply. It has never been easier to study theology. Come to our open house to find out more. These are great questions, but the bigger question is, is there more to life than this? Alpha Online is a series of sessions exploring life, faith, and meaning. Each week, we'll meet on Zoom and kick off with a video on the week's topic. 
Then comes the fun part, small group discussions. This is a safe space to ask questions, say what you think, hear what others have to say, and best of all, make some new friends along the way. Our next run of Alpha Online starts on Wednesday 9th of June at 8pm. So if you've got questions, why not bring them to Alpha? Hi, my name's Abby, and today I'm going to speak on the family of God. And we're going to go right back and look at where it all started, which was straight after Pentecost, which we celebrated last Sunday. And so the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. The disciple Peter, he got up and he explained what was happening. Very helpful. And then because of that, 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus, were filled with the Spirit, and they joined the church. And that's where we pick up the story today. We're going to look at what the first church looked like. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A few Christmases ago, my parents bought me one of those DNA testing kits where you send off essentially like a tube of your spit um, in the post and then they send you back things, information about your family, your DNA, your heritage, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was really excited to kind of find out a bit more about that. Although, to be fair, my mum is from England and my dad is from Northern Ireland and so I was kind of sure it was going to come back 100% white British. And then the tests results came back and I find out I am 2.2% Arabic. I was really excited about this um, and now all my family want to get the test and find out more. What does your family look like? What does your family of origin look like? Was it created biologically or through adoption or through marriages being joined? Do you speak multiple languages at home or do you have different routines? Are there people in your family that you don't know? Does it look like what you expected it would? We can sometimes think that when we become a Christian, it's a transaction between me as an individual and God. And that's true. <laughs> Through what Jesus did on the cross, our relationship is restored with God. But last week, Miles mentioned in Galatians 4 verse 6, that it's through the Holy Spirit, when, he, when we put our faith in Jesus, that we receive the spirit of adoption. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. It's not just a relationship between us and our Heavenly Father, but as a result of being filled by the Spirit, we are restored relationally with all believers, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We gain siblings. We are part of the family of God, which is so much bigger than just us alone. The family of God was transformed at Pentecost because they had been filled by the Holy Spirit for the very first time. Your experience of church may not resemble family. My friend, before she became a Christian, said going to church is like going to a book club where you hadn't read the book. And maybe for you, you associate church more with buildings and architecture. But Nikki Gumbel says, church isn't an organization you join. It's a family where you belong. But in this season, when we're not actually seeing each other physically, it's so important that we encourage and remind ourselves what the family we're part of actually looks like. And so today we're going to take a look at three family traits um, and we're going to look at devotion, serving others and sharing our lives. So the first family trait we read up is they were devoted in verse 42 and 43 of Acts, it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, 
Devotion kind of feels like they've set the bar quite high as the early Christians. I don't know about you, but when I think of the word devotion, I'm picturing very serious, holy people or people who live outside of the normal routines and responsibilities of daily life. But for the first Christians, devotion was very practical. We read that they did four things. They listened to teaching, which is reading the Bible. They had fellowship with other Christians, which is spending time in the community. They broke bread together, which is just eating together, but also in remembrance of what Jesus did, like the way we take communion. And they prayed. So if today you're asking, how can I grow as a Christian? Well, it's quite simple. The first Christians used these four things as a structure for growth, but it didn't stop there. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. The family of God were devoted to learning and to growing, but they were also devoted to making space for the Holy Spirit to move. They did the natural and the Holy Spirit did supernatural in their lives. It's structure and space. Every time we build reading the Bible into the structures of our day, we're making space for the Spirit. When we spend time with other Christians, we're making space for the Spirit. When we break bread, we're making space for the Spirit. When we structure our days around prayer, we're making space for the Spirit to move. We don't have to retreat from our daily lives in order to experience the Holy Spirit. What's so encouraging here is in verse 43, it says that it was the apostles who performed the wonders and signs. But actually in the family of God, when we look forward at the church, just 20 years later, when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, we see that it's not just the apostles or leaders or a super elite that are performing the signs and wonders through the Holy Spirit, but the whole church is involved in practicing the gifts of the Spirit. And a way we did that recently as a church, a way we created space for the Spirit was through our daily devotions. We took a different gift of the Spirit each day and we spent time um, trying to understand better what that could look like in our lives and then asked to receive it. And all of those videos are up on YouTube so you can go and check them out. And as we did those devotions throughout the week together, it was incredible because people started sending in their stories um, letting us know what God had done through their lives, in their homes, and through the Holy Spirit. Let me read out one of those stories to you. She said this to us. I was very skeptical and against praying in tongues. This morning, after hearing the meaning of this through the video, I tried and I had a wonderful experience. It was only between me and God, and I felt this real connection. I was singing in a strange language, praising Jesus, and I knew I was praising our Heavenly Father. It was a deep experience of connection. The natural and the supernatural. Devotion isn't about being weirdly intense all the time. It's actually defined here as persisting and persevering and continuing. And so that's what I want to encourage us in today. You might just feel like this is another sermon telling you to read your Bible and to pray. But God moves in the simple structures of our days. We can expect to see the Holy Spirit be part of our lives as we devote ourselves daily to these things. The second trait of the family is serving others. It says in verse 44 and 45, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I've got questions about this. It sounds like a logistical nightmare. Like how much were people expected to sell? And what was the criteria for people in need? Where's all the stuff stored? How much are you expected to donate? Like if you sold your property, where did you live? Like was everyone moving in together? The family of God is known for how they serve people. And at this point in the early church, straight after Pentecost, it was made up of mostly Jews. And the Jews had these lots of laws and customs um, surrounding how they were supposed to live. If you've ever tried to read the Bible, starting at Genesis, it was like Genesis, Exodus, you hit Leviticus. And that is the book of the law. It's like full of uh, customs and guidelines. And 
the Jews wouldn't only have known these, but they would have actually followed them to the letter. One of the laws on this topic of serving others or giving to the poor said that if you owned land, like a field or a vineyard that you could grow stuff on, then you weren't allowed to harvest it right out to the edges. Well, why? In Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10, it says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over the, your vineyard for a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. The Jewish law put a limit on landowners so that they couldn't maximize their crop. They had to ensure that there was provision left over for people that were landless, that were poor, and that were foreign. Now, it didn't define how much you had to leave. You could leave a little or a lot. As long as you tick that box, you fulfilled the law. And there was no other requirement to interact with those people, to wait for them, or to set up some kind of support system. You just left what was on the ground and they came and picked it up. But these Jews have now come to faith in Jesus. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the guidelines around serving each other and giving to people in need have changed. So what difference has the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church made in this area of serving others? Well, giving is no longer dictated by fulfilling a quota or being obliged to follow a principle. But through the Holy Spirit, we serve one another out of love. We are no longer asked to passively leave provision for people, but the family of God is active in meeting the needs of people inside and outside of the church. Just a side note, um, just to clear a few things up, this was not a communist regime, this was not socialism. And there was no coercion involved in asking people to sell their property, or you didn't have to sell your stuff to be part of the church or to become a Christian. And actually, some historians think that it was because a lot of the new converts, um, they'd come to Jerusalem, they'd been filled with the Spirit, they joined the church, and so they weren't from there. They didn't have anything. And so part of this was to help them get back up on their feet. What does this mean for us? If it's not a set of rules to follow, how do we serve people's needs? Well, if we want to meet people's needs, then we need to know what those needs are. At the start of this month, we um, had Mother's Day and we celebrated that here at HTBB through um, doing a project with our food bank. And our food bank um, meets the practical needs of people on like a really regular basis within KL. And we deliver food parcels out to them. But for Mother's Day, we wanted to make that extra special for all of the mums that are in our food bank community. And so we decided that we were gonna um, get these tote bags and fill them with gifts for the mums. And so we gathered together and we, we were writing a list of the suggested items to place in the bags. And I just started putting in things that I would like or that I think are quite nice. And very kindly, Lam Lam, who is part of our food bank team, um, she kindly points out what actually would and wouldn't work for the food bank moms. Lam Lam knows these women. She's part of that community. And so she has a much better insight into what would be helpful. She's also a mum, so she can connect with them and identify with what would be good. And so we were able to put together these um, tote bags and these gifts, and we were able to deliver to over 150 mums in our food bank community. It takes relationship and humility to ask people what they need and not just assume that we know. The transformation that the Holy Spirit brings to our lives in this area is that before it was ruled and confined and possibly about doing the bare minimum, and now serving others is wide open. We have a responsibility as the family of God to identify the needs of those around us and respond. And so it begs the question, are we aware of the immediate needs in our communities? Maybe you're not sure where to start or you're not sure where to help. And so one way I, I like to think about this is by asking myself the question, well, where have I been grateful for others' contribution in my life? Because Sometimes we're on the giving end of this, but at other times we're on the receiving end. And a few years ago, my husband Stu got dengue 
oh, and we had to go to the hospital for over a week. He was admitted and we literally had no clue. Like that was our first time experiencing anything like that. But people were on it. People from church were all over it. They sent us food to the hospital. They sent supplies to our house. Like we had enough papaya leaf juice and rhino water to last us forever. But also people just WhatsApp me. We're checking in, seeing how Stu was doing. How could they pray? How could they serve our needs? Serving each other covers the entire spectrum from practical to emotional to spiritual. We no longer live as individuals, but as part of a family that seeks to serve each other. The third trait of the family of God is sharing our lives. It says in verse 46 and 47, Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The family of God shares life together. And these are all like new Christians and they're all fresh and excited for life. And they're so keen. They meet together every day in the temple in verse 46, which is actually what they probably would have been used to doing is Jews. But they also added in something that Jesus modeled so well for them. Now, this is a very holy practice. This is something that they had to be very disciplined in doing multiple times a day. Eating. Now, I'm pretty sure all Malaysians have got this one down to fine art. But this is how Jesus shared life with people. In Luke 7, verse 34, it says about Jesus, the son of man, he came eating and drinking. And so when we read about Jesus's life in the Gospel of Luke, he's either going to a meal, he's at a meal, or he's coming from a meal. And he did this so much that the religious leaders of the day actually accused him of being a drunk and a glutton. So why was eating and drinking such an important part of Jesus's life? Well, if you think about it, who he dined with, who he ate with, was pretty much anyone from religious people to people who worked in government, people who worked on the street for a living, fishermen, his friends, home cooks. When Jesus ate with people, it wasn't just about enjoying the food, although I'm pretty sure that's a key part, but it was a place of community, of evangelism and discipleship. Eating around the table is a sign of friendship and of connection. And so it's absolutely no surprise that the earliest Christians made eating together a key part of church life. If you think about your kitchen table, where you eat your meals, or maybe your favorite mamak, where you like to go, what happens around the table? Yes, we have the food and we have the drinks, but also the conversations at family dinner, or the decisions that are made over dim sum, or the news that you share with a friend, while having coffee. Think about people you invite into your home or that you invite to restaurants to eat with. Food connects us. It gives us something in common and something to share in. It takes us from strangers to friends. And it's so biblical. There are so many food references scattered throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation. There are huge events that take place around the table. It gives us a glimpse of heaven where we are going to join in the great banquet full of feasting. This is such good news. This is something we have to do multiple times a day. And so we can all play our part in that. So as you eat with whoever today, tomorrow, any day this week, or if you live alone and you've already got your long list of post-MCO catch-ups, how can we bring a glad and sincere heart praising God to the conversations around our tables. The early church did life like this, meeting together in the temple, eating together in people's homes until they couldn't. Just two chapters later, Peter and John, their leaders are arrested. They're put in prison, they're interrogated, and then persecution breaks out across the whole church. And so they can no longer meet at the temple. They can no longer eat together in people's homes. They had to adapt what being the family of God looked like, what being the church looked like. Sound familiar? I don't know how you're finding doing church online. 
And I know we're all absolutely looking forward to the day where we can gather everyone back in the room with mask-free worship and we can enjoy what the cafe team are serving up for breakfast. But we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that church online is just a stopgap or that we're just making do. Because even in not being able to meet physically, the church is alive, thriving and growing because of you. Being the family of God isn't just about gathering together at 11.30 a.m. on the top of Lot 10 rooftop every Sunday morning. Over the course of this whole year, church has been meeting online and we've had so many people requesting to get baptized. And a few months ago, we had a little window where we were able to hold some baptisms on site. And Miles asked one of the guys, well, you know, who was getting baptized, how long have you been coming to HTBB? And he said, oh, actually, this is my first time ever at HTBB physically. That guy had joined the church. He was meeting online. His faith had come alive during the pandemic and then he was able to get baptized. God hasn't slowed down. The church hasn't paused and the Holy Spirit isn't in the main hall waiting for us all to return. Even when gathering physically has stopped, the church still remains. I really want us to get this, what it means for HTBB. We are the church. When you are on your fourth Zoom call of the day, we are the church. When you bump into your neighbors taking the dog for a walk, we are the church when we're around the dining room table with our families. The Holy Spirit is at work wherever we are, gathered and scattered. And we know this because in the early church, it was the same. In the midst of being scattered, we read in Acts 4, chapter 4, that many who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to 5,000. The opportunity for people to hear the good news of Jesus in this season is huge. We have way more than positive vibes to send. We have the power of the Holy Spirit and the reassurance of God's love. And in verse 47, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We are the church. We display what the result of a life that has been rescued looks like. And it's the attractiveness of the family of God that draws people in as we devote our days, as we serve each other, and as we share our lives together. And so I would love for us all to pray together now. I would love for you to receive an opportunity also um, for someone to pray with you, for the Spirit to speak into whatever is going on in your life today. And so we're going to invite the Spirit. We're going to wait on Him and I'm going to pray. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. You might want to close your eyes. You might want to hold out your hands like I'm doing. Let me just wait on the Spirit. We have a whole team of people who would love to pray for you today. You can click request prayer um, and a window will pop up and someone will privately be able to pray with you. But I was also, as we were praying, if you have felt like you want to be able to um, tell people about Jesus around your dining room table, we would love to pray for you, that you'd be filled with the Spirit's power to be able to share freely what God has done in your life. Maybe you find that hard in your family. Also had a sense that there's someone watching this and you would describe yourself today as having a broken heart. Whatever has gone on in your life, we also want to stand with you. We want to pray for um, God's peace to be with you and his comfort at this time. But also, maybe you want to be filled with the Spirit for the first time today. Maybe you want to know His power in your life. And so, again, we would love to be able to pray with you and for you today. Please get prayer. We have a whole team waiting for you. You can click Request Prayer. And we're going to go back and worship now together as we do that. Suddenly a 
thank you that it is not physical buildings but your people that make the church so lord we pray that just as you have given us all a part to play i pray that you would give us wisdom that you would show us opportunities 
to serve those around us, Lord, to bless the church and impact our communities. Come Holy Spirit, we invite you to empower us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you still like prayer, just click the request prayer button and our online team of pastors will be right with you. Yeah, and if you'd like to stay connected with us throughout the week, uh, you know, maybe you want to re-watch one of the sermons or you want to maybe share uh, any of our content with your friends, uh, do give us a follow on our social media platforms. We post content regularly throughout the week. Once again, thank you for joining us. Have a great week.